All right, now let's talk about Animal Development, Chapter 47. Um, so this is the general pattern that animals follow and the embryonic development that occurs in animals. Of course, it starts with fertilization of the egg to form the zygote. But then once the zygote's formed, you go through first cleavage, the splitting of it into multiple cells, um, ultimately forming the which is called the blastula or blastula stage, the hollow ball stage. And then you go through gastrulation where cells begin to migrate and move around the blastula, um, begin the formation of or different organs in that organism. And in the case of some animals going through metamorphosis from a juvenile to a, an adult stage, not all animals go through metamorphosis. For example, mammals do not. We come out as little versions of our adult selves. Fertilization, the getting together of the uh, male gamete and the female gamete, the sperm and the egg. And um, so, of course, there are, will be many male gametes that are attempting to fertilize the egg. Um, you want to prevent this from happening. Essentially, you don't want what's called polyspermy to happen. You don't want multiple fertilizations because you want to end up with a diploid zygote. So what happens is um, the first successful sperm cell will first initiate what's called the acrosomal reaction, where the acrosome releases this compound that begins to break down this region called the zona pellucida that covers the egg. And once that happens, the sperm cell will fuse with the egg. It will release its nucleus, its haploid nucleus. And this fusing and the releasing of the sperm nucleus initiates what's called the cortical reaction, uh, where cortisone is released into the zona pellucida, which causes it to separate a bit from the egg and to sort of harden up such that other sperm cells cannot fertilize this egg, thus presenting, preventing again polyspermy. All right, so embryonic development, again, in animals has some characteristic stages where you have cleavage that begins to form the multiple stages. Um, you get the formation of a an, of an, uh, space inside that um, embryo. The early stages is known as the morula, but then finally the blastula, or the hollow ball stage. Um, now, even so, we could think of a fertilized egg or zygote as sort of the... Um, ultimate stem cell, you might say, because it's a it's an undifferentiated cell. Okay, it's not a muscle cell, a nerve cell, like that. It's just a zygote. And it's going to begin cell divisions and ultimately form all those things, but it's relatively undifferentiated. However, it does not have a uniform distribution of materials inside that cell. There are certain compounds clustered on one end, certain compounds clustered on the other, and then certain compounds clustered in this little sliver here, this part called the Great Crescent. And so you have what we call an unequal distribution of cytoplasmic determinants, compounds, proteins largely that are inside this zygote, but some clustered more at one end and others clustered more at the other end. And so it gives polarity to the zygote. Um, one end we call the gray end here, we call the animal pole. The yellow pole is called the vegetal pole. And this part is known as the Gray Crescent. And so even at the zygote stage, the animal pole is going to develop into what is going to become the anterior end and the vegetal pole, the posterior end. The gray crescent is going to develop into the dorsal or back side of the organism. So you do have polarity at this stage. Cleavage occurs in a particular way at the beginning to essentially split into two cells that each contains some of the animal pole, vegetable pole, and gray crescent in relatively equal amounts. So two cells that essentially have the same amount of the different cytoplasmic determinants. Okay. In some animals, you get what's called holoblastic cleavage, where you get a complete splitting in two, and then four, and then eight of cells of approximately the same size. But in some, particularly birds, um, reptiles, animals that lay an egg, uh, 
you have what's called meroblastic cleavage where essentially most of the splitting of the cells occurs at one end essentially the animal end, the animal pole end and the yolk remains as this large mass that doesn't really split into separate cells. Um, remember that the yolk is going to, it contains a lot of nutrients, a lot of food that the embryo that is developing on the animal pole end here in the case of meroblastic cleavage is going to provide the food for those cells in that developing embryo. All right, this process has been studied extensively, uh, and that is embryo development in sea urchins. And here we see we've got our blastula or hollow ball stage at the inside is known as the blastocele. And we begin the migration of cells into the blastocele. So this is gastrulation. These cells are beginning to migrate in. And so you're forming the different germ layers. You've got what's going to become the outer layer of the organism, the uh, ectoderm. But you're forming the endoderm, the yellow part, and the mesoderm, the red, red cells. Um, you can see essentially developing through gastrulation the openings of the organisms, the mouth and the back end, and the digestive tract, and organs that are associated with it and other internal parts of the animal. Um, here it is again in a frog. You've got gastrulation where cells are migrating, folding in, uh, forming a part where, where those cells are just moving into the inside of that embryo. You have what's called the dorsal lip. And um, we'll see a little in a moment how the dorsal lip, how important it is. So here we have this embryo. Where we've got the different layers, the different germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, and yellow, mesoderm, and red. And here we see um, a uni unique event that happens on the dorsal or back side of the embryo where some of these um, ectoderm cells begin to fold in and they essentially are forming the dorsal hollow nerve cord or what's going to then develop into the nervous system. So the nervous system develops from ectoderm by this infolding of cells. And here we see that again, these endoderm, ectoderm cells that fold in to form the nervous system. Some of the mesocord, uh, the mesoderm are going to form the notochord, and that's going to develop into the skeletal system. Um, and again, the endoderm. So here's our three cell layers, our three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. We already talked about the mesoderm forming the notochord and the skeletal system, ectoderm um, forming the nervous system. Of course, the ectoderm becomes the skin, the outer covering, the epithelial cells that line the mouth, for example. Um, I would just remember a few of the structures that form from each of these. You know, I wouldn't worry about memorizing the whole list, but just a, a few of them for each. All right, the amniot, amniotic egg. So in um, reptiles, birds, and mammals, they are all, all known as amniotes. And these are animals that largely live on land and lay their eggs on land. And so the water that surrounds the egg of a amphibian, for example, or a fish that is laid and has external fertilization has to be contained within the egg. And so the amnion is the membrane that surrounds the embryo that contains this liquid, the amniotic li fluid that the embryo is bathed in. However, there are other membranes. There's the chorion that surrounds the whole thing, the whole schmear. There's the allantose, which is this membrane that will, for the most part, retain waste that come from the embryo. And the yolk sac, that, as we mentioned earlier, has the food for the growing embryo. Um, these are all appear nicely in birds' eggs, chickens' eggs. Um, the allantose and the yolk sac play a lesser role in mammals because most mammals don't lay an egg, and the nutrients come from mom, and mom deals with the waste. They don't have to accumulate inside an egg. All right, uh, mammals with a uterus, an endometrium, the cells that line the uterus. This is where the 
um, developing embryo implants. It typically will implant at the um, blastula stage. Um, we mentioned in an earlier slideshow about the trophoblast, these cells that develop into the um, placenta. You can see maternal tissues, maternal blood vessels beginning to proliferate around that developing embryo. Um, and again, you see the different at the amnion, the chorion, the yolk sac, and the allantose. They're all present, but again, the yolk sac and the allantose play somewhat of a lesser role in mammals than in birds and reptiles. <coughs> This just shows how the ectoderm develops into that neural tube and how the cells begin to grow in a pattern that causes them to first stretch out and then become wider on one end, which causes this infolding. It's kind of an interesting way that they grow to form this tube that then pinches off to form the nervous system. With cleavage, we talked a little earlier about that. You're going to split the cell into two that has some of the animal, the gray crescent, and the vegetal pole, and that's the way it's supposed to go. Um, if you were to take these two cells and separate them completely, they have the potential to develop into two completely separate embryos. They would, of course, be identical twins. Now, if you artificially cause cleavage to occur, not in the proper way, but in a way that essentially one gets all of the gray crescent and the other doesn't, and you split those in two, you don't get identical twins. You get one normal embryo, and you get one that is undifferentiated, a little belly piece. It does not develop its backside because it's missing the gray crescent. Talked about the dorsal lip, where in gastrulation those cells are migrating, and that dorsal lip is extremely important. It's known as the organizer. Um, and if you artificially take the dorsal lip from one embryo and implant it on another in the wrong place, you'll essentially get a secondary embryo developing. They'll be attached to each other. Um, so that dorsal lip plays an important role in the polarity organization development of embryos. Um, in an embryo, the cells that are adjacent to each other, communicate with each other. They use compounds that they release to communicate, and the cells essentially know, in quotes, where they are in relative to other cells. And so here we have the limb bud, essentially the wing of this chicken, this embryonic chicken forming. And so there are compounds released by the cells at the very tip of the bud, and those cells essentially know they're at the tip of the, the bud, and they're going to develop into particular parts of this limb. And this part here, known as ZPA, let me make sure I get the name of this thing right. This is known as the, where is it? The zone of polarizing activity. And the AER is the apical ectodermal ridge. And this zone of polarizing activity is important for developing one side of the wing. And in experiments, so oh, I don't have the picture here, but in the textbook, there's an experiment where they took the ZPA from one embryo and transplanted it into a different embryo at this spot up here. And what happens is on that limb, you essentially get the limbs developing into a single limb, but it has sort of two parts to it. It's this serious defect, kind of this monstrosity of a wing, because they've taken a cluster of cells that should be on one side and put them on the other side, and so you don't get proper development. So that, that shows the importance of those cells and those cells being in the right spot for proper development to occur. Okay, that is chapter 47.